um, I've been contributing to Sandwich Mod for just over four years now, I think. Um, I, uh, I graduated my computer science degree uh, in 2013. Um, that was very robotics focused, my dissertation was robotics. And I just generally like to make cool things, uh, quadcopters, robots, stuff like that. So that's a bit about my background. Right. This talk's going to cover a, a few key points. Basically, at the beginning of the, ro uh, sort of the basics of robotics, so sensors, um, motors, actuators, uh, basically all the basics you need to know about robotics. Um, and then how to relay that onto Android devices. Um, I've got, this is basically what I have built and will be sort of talking about. This is a small robot that you can connect to your phone via Bluetooth and it gives, makes your phone or tablet into a movable robot that you can code to whatever you want. And also I'm going to talk about computer vision. <coughs> and, um, basically just to introduce computer vision and the NVIDIA stuff that's going to come afterwards. So what makes what are the main components of a robot? We've got the sensors, which can vary widely between robots. You can have ones that just have uh, positioning sensors and they just use some, some GPS to move around. Um, uh, yeah, and then you can have some that are really advanced that have a lot of um, cameras or 3D cameras that connects to map the environment around. You. Um, this is probably one of the points where robots can vary the widest. So pretty much all robots have got some sort of mechanism to move around. So motors, uh, wheels, legs, tracks, whatever you want. They're, they're, they've all got some move, one, some method of moving around. Um, but the sense is where it varies the most. You've also got the processing unit, or the, where, where the processing is done. Not all, but this talk we're going to be looking at the processing unit being the Android device. So, yeah, so we're, we're going to go through these very, very briefly. Right, sensors are categorised into two main categories. Um, you've got um, proprioceptive and extraceptive. Uh, can't pronounce it. Um, basically, proprioceptive reads the internal state of the robot, the position of wheels, position of arms, um, yeah, the internal state. Um, extraceptive, extraceptive gathers information about the environment around it. So. Um, camera, we were seeing um, colours around it, um, sonar to find out how the distance of things, um, GPS to find out its actual location in the world. So, yeah, they, they split up into two main categories. And underneath that, there's two other um, categories, which is active and passive. Active sensors um, actually produce a signal to read in the environment, like um, sonar sensors, they will um, create a signal to bounce off something, so to read how far it is away from something, it will produce a signal and then time how long it takes to get back. Um, the other ones like that are sort of laser sensors um, and, and the like, Kinect 3D cameras, they're all active because they create a dot of uh, invisible light just to read it back on the camera. Passive sensors just read what's around them. So a camera without a, la a, camera without a light on would be a passive because it doesn't actually have to produce anything to read it back. A microphone doesn't have to produce any sound to read it back. So they're the uh, they're another two subcategories. Um, then it comes to the actuators, which are basically the movement parts of the robot, so wheels, motors, they, 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 they allow the uh, robot to interact with the environment around them. Um, yeah, the robot, yeah, so, <coughs> yeah, <coughs> movement and environment manipulation, like picking things up or moving things around. So, what does this mean in relation to Android? Because obviously, Android doesn't have any um, uh, sort of movement control. You don't, you don't have a phone that has wheels. So. But they do have a large array of sensors. Like, um, if you think about a standard Android phone, um, say the Motorola G, a very a very cheap phone. But it's got um, accelerometer, gyroscope, microphone, camera, um, uh, I think it's, uh, compass as well. Um, and that's a very, very 
cheap phone and it's got all the, sens <coughs> all the sensors you could want to start you're beginning to making robots. So. Here. so here's a list basically of all like, the sensors that you get in a standard, in the sort of sensing device you have in a standard Android device and sort of what categories they fall under. Um, so when you pick up a an Android device, you're pretty much guaranteed it's going to have at least most of those on there. Uh, barometer, maybe not, but they, they have enough on there for you to actually start doing some really cool things with robots. One thing they don't have is because they don't have the appendages to begin with to do anything like the actuators. They, ca they can't read. Really, they don't have the ability to read their own internal state, which is probably one of the main issues with getting Android in, making a robot out. Android devices because they, they don't have wheels, so they don't have any way of re retrieving information about how what the tilt of the wheel is or where the position of the servo is. But I'll come back to that one later. Yeah, so like I said before, um, they're not designed to be robots, so they don't have any actuators to interact with the environment. So that's the, that's the key issue we've got to cover in this talk. Yeah, so we've got a couple of issues. The lack of internal sensors to read things and the lack of actuators to uh, manipulate the world around us. However, we do have the plus side of having many sensors and also the and actually developing Android apps is extremely simple in comparison to, say, making, making use of Raspberry Pi to do the same thing. Because you've got the Android SDK, you've got the simple way of retrieving the sensor information. And Right, so some of the advantages to Android devices, they're, they're cheap, like I said before, they're actually... Right, you just speak a little bit louder? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, they're, yeah, they're powerful for what they are. I mean, the uh, Moto G, I think, is a, or at least most phones, or at least dual-force phones now, they've got enough processing power to do at least some simple image recognition, um, image processing, and, yeah, we, they're, Pretty capable, yeah. Um, you've got these to create projects. You can really, really um, set up a robotic thing, a robotic um, project in the SDK very simply, like within minutes if you want to. Um, and there's lots of projects online which has already done similar things with documentation. Lots and lots of projects. So there's no, you can go on Stack Overflow and find someone who's done something similar and, or at least along the same lines, and you can bring it to fruition. Right, to overcome the main problems about uh, using Android as a robot, you need to do one thing, you need to do a couple of things. One main thing is make it a body for it to be able to move around the environment and um, interact with the environment, um, which can be as simple or as complex as you want. I'm going to go through a simple way and literally show you how to make it. Uh, this couple of tasks I have to do, have to, you have to have some kind of method of communicating with the Android device. Um, in this instance, it'll be communicating over Bluetooth, serial, uh, and yeah, enable it to move around the environment. Optional extras we can put into this is to give it some appropriate set of sensors so it can read its own state and move around the environment, uh, while it's moving around the environment, um, how many wheel turns it's done, calculate distances. All that stuff. And optional, you can provide the power to the Android device because Android devices don't generally have a long enough battery life to stay on for a long period of time with the screen on, sensors on, everything going full belt. You can, but the robot can have a massive battery on it, so you can power the Android device for hours upon hours if you want to. Here's the one I bought today. Basically, it's um, a standard robotic chassis that you can go buy from anywhere. You can go on eBay and buy this robotic chassis. Um, and I'm just going to go through some of the main components that I have um, used to uh, create this robot. The communications is used by a HC06 Bluetooth oh, serial, over, serial over Bluetooth module. That just wires directly <coughs> to any serial, 3.3 uh, volt serial device. Um, it connects just like any other Bluetooth device. There's no, no real 
magic setting up, it just works. Um, the Android um, SDK has got a lot of, has got the ability for you to easily connect to it and send data over serial. So that is the simplest way of actually connecting to it. These, and this component is extremely cheap. Under, you can get them for under five pounds. Like I said earlier, the chassis is basically the entirety of the red bit of this is the chassis, and it comes with the wheels and motors all together. And again, you can get it. you can get any of those off eBay extremely cheaply. Um, to power the motors, that's the only thing that's not included with the motor package. Um, you have to get a, a hate bridge or an ESC of some kind just to drive the motors. Um, again, that wires directly into anything that can generate a PWM signal. Um, hate bridges have got the uh, they can't be able to um, break, so you can actually stop the robots from rolling on somewhere else. Um, and most of them have a 5 volt regulator, so you can actually plug that directly into the USB port of the Android device and power it from that, rather than have any other electronics there to uh, regulate the voltage and to regulate the voltage and allow the Android device to keep on for longer periods of time. <coughs> and so at the heart of the chassis itself, there is a uh, Adreno um, board. It can be any Adreno board. On this one, it's an Adreno Micro. Um, they're easy to get hold of, easy to program for running Adreno IDE, like you've seen in some of the media, probably seen in some of the media tech, tech talks. You can do, do things very quickly on them. In fact, instead of using Adreno, you could use one of their um, uh, little dev boards they've got here today. Um, they can produce. They produce the PWM signal to actually drive the motors. So that's where the motor control comes from, and that links directly into the. Um, but uh, H bridge remote control. Now we're getting on to a bit of computer vision. Um, computer vision is sort of a very key part of robotics. Um, they need to be able to, it allows them to actually see, uh, they can see the environment and you can process things. You can do um, image recognition, object tracking, face detection, um, and it's a major plus that all Android devices have um, cameras because you don't have to think about how to wire them in, how to get the data from the camera and process it. It's already there on the device and there's already um, libraries for you to get that data and process it very easily. However, um, a key point that I like to make at this, at this point, there is no one computer vision library that's hardware accelerated for all um, platforms at the moment. So if you were developing for a Qualcomm phone, you would have to use a, a library called FastCD to get hardware acceleration. If you want to develop for M NVIDIA, you would probably use OpenCD because they have a hardware accelerated version of that, which makes the image processing, um, I'll show you later, um, a lot faster. Um, without it, things come to, to get very, can get very slow. Yeah, like I said, NVIDIA, you get OpenCV, which is hardware accelerated, and they they deal with hardware acceleration for you. You don't have to do anything different in your code to use it. It's um, uses the same uh, API. You just the actual um, OpenCV manager deals with switching of the library from the standard um, CPU variant to the hardware accelerated variant without actually touching the code. It just does that automatically for you. If you were doing Qualcomm, you would have to use FastCV, which I haven't actually had any um, experience with myself, but um, it, again, is a comprehensive image processing library um, that you can use to accomplish pretty much the same thing as you can in OpenCV. Uh, I'm going to be talking, well, I'm going to be going over the key parts of OpenCV. Um, OpenCV is a massive um, project that is uh, for image processing, image uh, segmentation, and uh, image, rec image recognition. Um, there is a very good Android port for it, which has been running for a long time now. It works um, both with a Java API and a native API, so you can either use a JNI um, uh, binary to actually call the native version of it, or you can um, use the Java one, which um, 
some people might prefer because it's easier to bring up, or it might be, um, they might prefer to use the joke, not native one if they've used the CV before on their uh, desktops or other projects. There is n a lot of information on the internet about OpenCV. Um, really, there's a lot, massive amounts of information. If you want to do something, you can go and Google it, and there'll be someone there trying to do the same thing, maybe not quite, or something on the same lines. You can um, go and use what they go by their example and get whatever you want. Like I said before, OpenCV um, hardware acceleration automatic switches, and uh, they use a thing called OpenCV Manager to do this. You don't you don't bundle the OpenCV library with your application. You um, basically call it, and it loads it from the OpenCV Manager. If there's a hardware accelerated version of OpenCV for your platform, as you can see at the bottom there, this one's uh, saying it's you might be able to see the it's T <coughs> which means it's detected that your the device is a TGRC um, device and it will load the hardware optimized version of OpenCV. Now here's a little bit of um, a benchmark between what you can get with um, hardware accelerated versus um, non-hardware accelerated. Uh, the values of that is that cut that off. I do apologize. For that. They're in um, milliseconds of processing time. So um, basically, the one at the far end that way is the Snapdragon 8 one, the same one as what you've got in the um, Z Xperia Z2, the OnePlus One, I think. Um, basically, all the Qualcomm leaders. That's just there to show you what um, a flagship can do on purely CPU power rather than um, GPU power. Um, the as you can see in the middle, you've got TK1 and T4, which are NVIDIA's, both, both NVIDIA's optimized um, chips for this. And the far end this way, um, with the <coughs> TK1, there is actually now the ability to use um, CUDA on these devices, which, um, is, as you can see here, it's, it seems like in this benchmark that the TK1 is actually slower, which it is at this point, because the, this benchmark, all it did was load an image to the GPU process and load it back. Um, that becomes a disadvantage when you're doing very small OpenCV tasks because it has to load the image from um, CPU memory onto GPU memory, process it and load it back. And it's the moving of it between CPU memory to GPU memory that becomes slow for very small tasks. But then when you get onto really longer tasks, it gets um, faster and faster because the, the gains outweigh the losses. So you can see in the next slide, which is uh, a lateral filter. That, um, yeah, so here the CUDA um, one has actually become a lot faster because it's actually a longer task to do. Um, as you see, the, the hardware acceleration gets a lot of gains over the software version, or not software, the CPU version, because um, it's multiple times faster. Even on, even on the T4, which was the last generation of Tigra devices, it's still beating the Snapdragon by quite a quite a margin. However, if I run this on fast CD, then I'm sure that the A01 would be just as fast. This is just a demonstration to show that, yes, um, to show you how um, the hardware acceleration helps. Because unfortunately, in OpenCV, you can't disable the hardware acceleration for the device. It has to, if it detects that you've got a um, Tigra 3, it switches it on and nothing to do about it. So I can't, I, I, there's no way of actually showing the actual performance increases. Um, They've actually got a test app that does switch it off, but they don't document how they switch it off, so we don't, we don't know how. I could show that in this. Okay, that's the end of my slide. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk, like, get some questions from you because this is supposed to be like a start session. Um, I didn't know what the um, level that people have been here would be, so I've just kind of tried to intro you to it, and I just want to ask you to ask questions about how you would go about making um, your phone into an Android device and what the what to what to expect, what you need to do. Um, yeah, so questions. Yeah. Does the robot run? It was supposed to. That's why I've kind of left this a bit short because um, it was supposed to run around on the floor. But unfortunately, when I brought this today, the charger went pop when I plugged it in. Oh. So it is a dead robot at the moment. Um, for reference, this, the. On this, point, on this device, the 
phone that was being used was an Xperia uh, ZL uh, that just literally tie wrapped to the front. But because you can use any device, any Android device with this, so over Bluetooth, you could put, um, you, could, you, could, you could in fact put a 10 inch tablet on top of this. Not that it would go very far, but you could put a 10 inch tablet on top of it and do what you want with it. Um, you could put any device. You didn't use an Apple device if you wanted to, because there's no um, specifics for that. <laughs> Just because it's done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I have a Moto G, and yeah. I use the Celsius as well. But I found in the Moto G, the gyroscope was not, it's not really good for, for real time things and stuff. Yeah. And I find it very, very difficult to find information about these kind of sensors when I went to the Firefox. <coughs> I really have to test it and see what it was. Do you know where to get this information? I, um, <coughs> normally, you'll find it in the phones as. as there's a very specific subset of gyroscopes and compasses that they use in phones. Like um, in, in one generation, the Samsung the S5 and the, one, the HTC One, and everything. We use the same gyroscope just because it's the one at the time that's either the cheapest or the best. The best thing to do is to go online and go to XDA and find out what 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 the kernel has drivers for. And this, it might be able to take a little bit of digging, but you'll find it. And the data sets are normally online, or there's at least some sort of information for you to be find out how accurate they are and what the update update frequency can be and other stuff like that. The only thing I would say is it's not always about the sensor. It's about it's, it can be the implementation of the sensor. Like um, if a manufacturer has uh, made a product and they've accidentally mounted the compass the wrong way, they will put some sort of um, I, I would say hack or fix in for it because it wasn't known at the time um, that can actually mess with some, some of the readings. So you, you might find that you'll get you'll get it and it'll be reading something and it'll be a bit off from what you actually expect. Um, I actually recently uh, found it out. Um, I, the company I work for, I've made an augmented reality app and it uses the compass to basically plot things in sort of real world. And on the Nexus 5, everything works absolutely fine. But then I moved to a Sony Xperia Z1, which is an aluminium sh chassis, and the actual metal of the chassis interferes with the compass quite a lot, and it throws it up, and that would be quite, that is quite annoying, because everything sort of jumps around, because sometimes you can get the static, I think, it must be the charge you get on the actual chassis from holding it. It's, it's a bit strange, but you can get into weird things come up. Uh, so, there's been a lot of the TV and the last time I did it, significant difference uh, in terms of performances between using it with the NDK and using the channel port directly. Yeah. So in your experience, is it getting better or <coughs> would you still recommend to use the NDK? If you can get away with using, if, if you're comfortable using the NDK and make, uh, using the JNI to get it to work, that's going to be better because you, um, it is faster. Um, I, I do think the Java implementation is a bit more inefficient. Um, but it is easier to access for everyone because it, that if you're an Android app developer, you might not, you might never actually use NDK before this. So you might, so the chance that you might just feel like, yes, I can use the Java one just as easy, and then move on to the NDK afterwards. But I would definitely, if you know how to use the NDK, use use that one. It would be faster. Yeah. Also, on the Tigra devices, you can only access the CUDA functions from the NDK um, because the Java version doesn't have any. Differentiate, we don't differentiate between um, the GPU versions and the s CPU version. You know what? Any more? Qu any questions? Yeah. Oh, go on. What would you do differently with this robot in particular? Oh, this one. Um, what I would do is I would probably make it a bit bigger. Because at the moment it's quite small and it and it can't really ca carry much. I mean, the ZL is probably the, ma the max that it can carry without stopping. Um, but also, I would say that using a four-wheel robot, four-wheel drive robot like this, um, and say if I try to use it on this carpet, it might not turn very well because this four-wheel drive has got too much grip and it'll, it might not, it, it won't turn. The motors aren't powerful enough to break the friction, basically. Um, The other thing you could do is get, um, which um, Will and NVIDIA will be talking about afterwards, which would be using an actual development board for this, which is more, would, 
create a more advanced robot and you would open up more possibilities for you. But there are, if you like, go, want to start in robotics, if in comparison to Android, you've got to sort of sort out how you're going to get the sensor data back to the device, how you're going to, um, what camera you're going to use. Does the device, does the camera work in certain correct frames a second? Um, for example, when I did, when I was doing my university degree, I used um, a Raspberry Pi for um, object detection. And the Raspberry Pi is a brilliant device for teaching, but for um, getting data back from the camera is pretty poor because the USB um, bus is saturated to the point where the frames um, don't sometimes don't get back on time out. So, with using development boards, they can be more advanced, but they've got more they've got a lot more pitfalls where a beginner <laughs> and a robotic beginner might not know where to go after that. I mean, also. Things like GPS modules, the Raspberry Pi doesn't, the Raspberry Pi or Jets doesn't have a GPS module where your phone can literally, you just have a couple of lines of Java code to get the GPS coordinates or um, the compass <coughs> bearings. So you've got to think about things like that when you're going from thinking, do you want to start it on sort of an Android device or a, even an iPhone? You can accomplish basically the same things. Anyone? Do you have a recommendation for the boards? I mean, you our Arduino Micro. Uh, yeah, on this the is one for any particular reason, or you know, the Arduino Micro was used on this just because of the cost of it. It was the cheaper. You go on eBay, you can actually pick them up. If you order them from China, you can pick them up for like three dollars. Um, you can use any other device. Like I said, that um, I think the Linkit kit from MediaTek that actually pretty much got every everything in built onto the device, so you could actually almost get rid of the. And if you want to make a very simplistic robot, you could almost get rid of the. Android device entirely and use that. Uh, you can get the compass add ons, the barometer add ons, the light sensor add ons. Um, the only thing it can't do is um, image processing, which needs a bit more power behind it and uh, yeah, more power, more RAM. That thing's, I think it's got like 4 meg RAM, so I don't think it'll do much for <laughs> image processing. Yeah, Any more? Yeah, just, just just to know what's been able to achieve with this, with this robot with the Android phone, this is like a. Uh, <coughs> Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, um, there's a couple of demo apps that I was going to show, but it didn't run very well. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you my uh, GitHub um, name so you can go online and actually see the source code for it. I'll put it up <laughs> when I get home tomorrow at some point. Um, basically, I'm, there's a few projects I did. One was very simple, point north, and just use the compass to turn the robot and always point north. You just turn it around and point north. Um, outside, of, um, a simple GPS um, marker. Path follower. It would, it would follow a GPS pre plotted path, path around. Um, that's pretty good because um, Android phones have actually got very good GPS. Um, newer Qualcomm ones can get sort of like down to a meter accuracy, I think. I think, I think. So they're very good at that. Um, and another one was basically um, follow the face, just face recognition, uh, just follow the face around in front of you. So yeah, th those ones will be, I'll show you, the, I'll put the source code online. Also what I'm going to do is put the um, wiring diagrams for this specific robot online, so you could, and all the cut in the um, materials list, so you can go out and build one yourself if you want, and in all honesty, you don't need to, a lot of people wonder about soldering things, you don't actually have to solder, I think there's like two points on this that, you have, that are soldered, but you don't have to do it, you can buy the Adreno with a pin header on it that you can just plug into, so I will make sure that that's all online, so and just start playing around. Anyone? Yes, um, sorry, this might this might just be because you seem like a good daddy ass about this. I still okay. love watching Robot Wars as a kid. Yep. And I miss that it's not on TV anymore. Yep, yep. But has, is there like any tournaments in the UK or anything like that that's broadcast like on Twitch or something like that? You know, is there anything that you know of where people are still doing that? There's quite a lot of um, maybe not Robot Wars esque. Battle, battle Royale with robots, um, but there are tournaments like, um, I know there's robotic football, and there's actually leagues for robotic football. I've seen the robotic football, yeah. Um, there's, um, yeah, then there's uh, like robotic competitions where um, they, go, they go from really basic things like uh, robotic football up to really advanced <laughs> things like, um, they'll, get, um, they'll get some universities together and they'll say, here's a task, like, I think one of them was go around a shopping centre and pick up this list of items to put in the shopping bag and then come back. and. The, pe and the people who got the robot did it got the most accurate representation of what was on the list and was the quickest and the winner. So maybe not Robot Wars, I don't know anything Robot Wars S, but um, there's definitely some competition out there. 
But if you wanted to, you could go make your own robot and just start fighting with you. I was, I was, if I could make, if I made this thing bigger, I was thinking about getting a nerf gun attached to it and start shooting at people, but that didn't, that didn't turn out well. Open CD3. <laughs> <laughs> there was something at the Mythic Bay UK this year. Was there? Yeah, but that was not really a competition. So how do you start a Kickstarter to bring back Robot Wars? Uh, <laughs> just throw it on. <laughs> I probably would have to get, I um, can't remember his name off the top of my head, the guy, Fred Dwarf. Fred Charles. Fred Charles, to, Fred Charles, to um, present it, otherwise it's not the same thing. No, exactly. Um, down the road, it's alright. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, any more questions on this specific um, device? Um, I. I I'm going to say this is probably, you can probably tell this is one of my first talks I've done solo, uh, apart from the workshop yesterday, so. Yeah, um, so. Yeah. <laughs> I hope to get better, and I hope to do more things about robots and Android, because I think there's a lot of unexplored um, potential with Android devices, just because there's, it's just simple. You can just get your phone and put a cradle, put it on a cradle, and it goes around. I mean, Sony had something very cool with the, uh, the um, I think it was a Joy-Con last year, which was like a little dock that you put your phone in, and it actually spun around, and then looked for smiles, and it would just take pictures whenever, whenever it saw a smile, which is kind of one of the, it's kind of a, almost a ridiculous idea when you look at it, but it actually does quite well at what it does. I mean, if you put it in the center of a party, on your, if you're in a party and you put it on a desk, it'll get some quite good pictures. So, that's just one use. So. Cool. 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 Right. Thank you for listening. Um, if you've got any questions about this, I'll be wandering around. Uh, I'll also be carrying around a quadcopter at some point. I won't fly it because I decided against cutting people's faces off. So. <laughs> right. Thank you. Oh, yes.